Continuing debate. We're really pleased to debate. The Honourable Member for Cypress Hills Grasslands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'll be sparing my time with the member from uh, Louis Saint Laurent, and, and I'm very proud to do that. I know as we've got people over here who want to speak, uh, the whole list of them, the members opposite, I see they can hardly fill in their list. They've got people speaking for 20 minutes they don't even have anyone to share with. But uh, this, is a, this is an interesting debate today. I, I am uh, fascinated by the fact that the NDP is in neutral on this one, and I suspect it's probably because they've never seen a, a socialist or communist dictator that they didn't love, and so they're having a hard time uh, getting involved in this debate too far. But uh, certainly, uh, I just heard, I just heard my, the member from the NDP talk about how the, the Cuban people are going to manage the transition. That's how far removed they are from this this, discuss, or this uh, di discussion. And I guess I could talk for hours about the uh, damage that socialism and communists do wherever they're found, uh, but we don't have that time here today. Now, Mr. Speaker, it would have been better, actually, if the and, and Liberals had been in neutral on this issue as, as well. And I think if they had been on the, the eulogy that was presented, probably it would have gone unnoticed. But that isn't what happened here. And, and the comparison they're making today is, is a bit ridiculous, but they'll go ahead and they'll continue to make that. And I just want to, it's probably the language of, of such strong personal support that we, uh, that uh, Canadians and people around the world have noticed when, when a, 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 our Prime Minister referred to, uh, to Cuba's longest serving president, I think that caught people's mind because they knew how it was that he served. He served uh, with, at the point of a gun. Uh, they talked about, our Prime Minister talked about, to him anyway, uh, Fidel Castro was larger than life. And I know that he was larger than life uh, to the people who were on the ground in front of him. He talked about how he served his people for half a century. Well, he oppressed them for half a century, he ruled over them, he dominated them, he did not serve them for half a century. Our Prime Minister talked about how he's a legend, supposedly, is more of a nightmare for the Cuban people. And he talked about his tremendous dedication and love for his people, and I say especially for those folks that had to go before the firing squad. I think we get to the nub of the issue a little bit later in the eulogy when he talks about what an important person Fidel Castro was uh, to their family, where he calls him my father's friend, and he offers condolences to the family, friends, and many supporters of Mr. Castro. Certainly, he's not talking about the Cuban people at large in that eulogy, and concludes with another adjective of admiration, talking about him being a remarkable leader. It's not surprising that we had the, uh, the eulogies around the world, the, the Trudeau eulogies they were called, uh, to people like Mussolini, Pol Pot, John Wilkes Booth, Kim Jong-il, and Genghis Khan and Darth Vader in comparison to the, the, the Prime Minister's, uh, I would say, foolish uh, choice of words uh, in this. Perhaps the, uh, the Cubans, uh, Cuban hardship should have been recognized by our Prime Minister rather than celebrating his private loss. And Mr. Speaker, I don't think this whole debate today is actually about this eulogy. It's about leadership, and it's about a failure of leadership. And it's about much more than just a few words on a piece of paper that came out of the PMO. Because there's so many issues that this government faces where they're failing to lead Canadians in a proper way. We were just here at QP uh, just a, a, an hour and a half ago, two hours ago, and we had to listen to the electoral form minister stumbling all over the all over the place after she's put a committee together, a committee of all parties in this house that did its work, worked hard for six months. People, I couldn't believe the amount of time people dedicated to that committee through this summer and fall. They've met into the evenings, and she gets up and basically mocks the work that they've done. That's an example of the, the failure of leadership that we see in this government. We've seen uh, a failure yes, uh, just two days ago when they announced, made their announcement on the pipelines, trying to tell Canadians that, yes, we base one pipeline on science, and we'll, we'll approve Trans Mountain and Kinder Morgan on science when they know that uh, there's... there's uh, and then they turn around and they say, we're not going to approve the Northern Gateway Pipeline. Uh, and they just set science aside. Science has said there's nothing, there's no, there's nothing wrong with approving the Northern Gateway Pipeline. And they, they take it off because of, of politics. That's just another example of failure of leadership that Canadians are having to put up with with this government. Uh, certainly the, the whole carbon taxation discuss, discussion is turning out to be a huge disaster for this government. They knew nothing about carbon taxation, carbon pricing, cap and trade issues when they started, and they're finding out that it's not working out the way that they planned. It's going to be a disaster. We're going to find ourselves in the same situation that Ontario has found themselves in the last few years, where the leadership has now had to apologize for their own carbon taxation schemes that have just about driven this province of Ontario into bankruptcy. So there's all kinds of things. I, do, can I mention fundraising? Can I mention how inappropriate it is? All of us do fundraising. 
is it how inappropriate it is to have cabinet ministers who are the ones making the decisions, charging $1,500 a ticket for people to be able to come out and get access to them. So the finance minister is selling access to people involved in the financial industry. The justice minister is selling access to, to lawyers when she has, she has the power to appoint them as judges. We watch the innovation minister hosting fundraisers for people who want to come to him for funding. Mr. Speaker, is that appropriate? Canadians are getting sick and tired of this. And it was good to see on the weekend that this, this uh, foolish statement that came out of the PMO highlighted to Canadians once again the failure of, of leadership that we see in this country. Now, Mr. Speaker, I want to talk about the people of Cuba. Across the way today, they've kept talking about the people of Cuba. I, I had a friend of mine talk to, uh, talk to me, he sent me an email, he said, I was, I was holidaying in Cuba and I decided to spend some extra time wandering around and to see what it's like away from the resorts. And so he said, I talked to people and he said, all, it was, all I saw was basically the economic devastation that's been caused by Fidel Castro's communist regime. He said, free health care. Well, I've heard all week from the Liberals about free health care, celebrating free health care in, in uh, Cuba. The reality, he said, is there was nothing on the shelves. You couldn't even find an aspirin on the shelves. That's what the Cuban medical system is like when Fidel Castro and his brother are done with them. He said, we go to the grocery stores, the government grocery stores. There's only three things on the shelves there, Mr. Speaker. They're subsidized. Rice, beans, and rum. That's what's on the shelves that he found in, in the stores, the government grocery stores. So obviously the government provides labour to the resorts and the people who are working there they get paid about $20 a month to do this work while the government takes the rest of those, of those wages. Medical doctors. People keep talking about the Cuban medical system. Medical doctors in Cuba earning $25 a month. He said, as I tour the country, I see abandoned farmland growing nothing but weeds. Where's the help? Where's the assistance? Where's the aid uh, that comes, is supposed to come in to, uh, to help people learn how to farm? That, that regime has taken all of it. And he talked about farming still being done with animal power. And we all know it's pretty easy to find a 1957 Chevrolet in Cuba, but you won't find much newer than that. This has been a history of political repression, a whole history of internment. The firing squads were hopefully from years ago, but that's part of the history, the legacy of Fidel Castro. We, uh, we know that there's continuing political repression. It's a one-party rule. Um, my friend talked to me about walking around Havana and seeing how many pimps there were pimping out teenage girls for tourists to come and take advantage of them. And, and, and Cuba has gotten to be known as one of the leading places for child sex exploitation in this world. Those are the kinds of things that we're talking about celebrating the regime of, of Fidel Castro. It's ongoing religious pressure and persecution in, in, uh, in uh, Cuba. And that's what the Prime Minister is celebrating. And it's wrong. The, minister, or the member opposite wanted to talk a little bit about foreign affairs and global affairs. We can talk about that as well. It's a failure of leadership, not just on this Cuban issue, but a failure of leadership around the world. I know last spring the, the foreign affairs minister on one of his junkets went to Myanmar. He walked in there and he said, we'll give you some money, we'll give you $44 million, and he flew out again. Since then, the situation in, in Myanmar is completely disintegrated. There's a democratically elected government there that is dominated by the military in the last month. In the Rakhine state, there's, there's been a, a conflict that's gone on, and it's escalating. We hear nothing from this government. It started with a border clash where nine my, uh, Myanmarese policemen were killed on the border by uh, militants. Uh, they, they are, the government, or the army rather, has moved in there, and they've been uh, controlling the area. They've shut down access to the area. We hear nothing from this government. So, Mr. Speaker, Canadians are getting tired of this, a failure of, of leadership in every, every area. I mean, one of, in, just in terms of the, what's going on in, in uh, Myanmar, uh, head of the United Nations Refugee Agency said, as far as they can tell, that there are troops that are killing men, shooting them, slaughtering children, raping women, burning and looting houses, forcing these people to cross the river into Bangladesh. 30,000 people have left the country and have fled into Bangladesh. What do we hear from this government? Nothing. Another issue, of course, is the, is the persecution uh, of, of the Baha'i in Iran. It's a good example of a, a place where this government is silent one more time. This government has already one minute, Mr. Speaker. I'm just getting started. This government has, has uh, decided they want to legalize no, or normalize, rather, relationships with the, with the uh, regime of Iran. And there's cradle to grave persecution going on in there. Baha'is are the, are the largest non-Muslim minority in Iran. They're being persecuted. Their businesses are being stripped from them. They're being shut down. We just had someone shot in the street strictly because he was Baha'i. And what do we hear from this government? Nothing. We want normal relationships with Baha'i. We're not speaking up. 
So when the member opposite talks about this government defending human rights, that's not happening. And it, uh, it's one more indication of that failure of leadership that was just indicated by the example we saw last weekend. Questions and comments. Question commentaire, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I, listen, I listened to that long speech, and I couldn't help but smile. Uh, the Honourable Member uh, was part of a government that really didn't do, couldn't help any of these problems that he's talking about. And not only that, he's misleading Canadians. He's saying the government, this current government, has been silent, and he knows that's not the case. We have been very vocal about human rights issues around the world and here at home. But let me ask him this question. When his own party's critic, foreign affairs critic, the member from Thornhill, was invited to a round table with NGOs, with the president of the Saudi Human Rights Commission, while all NGOs raised important issues with the president of the Saudi Human Rights Commission, why didn't his member, why didn't his foreign affairs critic say a word, except after leaving, he issues a press release saying, oh, all these issues. I, I, he missed an opportunity, Mr. Speaker. He should have raised these issues. Honourable Member for Cypress Hills, Grasslands. Well, Mr. Speaker, on one hand, he says there was a press release, so he did raise the issues. The other hand, he's trying to say there was no press release. You know, this, this when our government was in power, we were respected around the world because, because of the capacity we had to lead. It wasn't because of, we go around taking pictures of ourselves and sharing them with people around the world. We are disappearing from the international scene. It's time we got some of, some of the courage back, some of the leadership back that we had in the past. All we've got now is a lot of talk, a lot of rhetoric, and no action. And we saw last weekend where the heart of this government actually is. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Regina Lubin. Mr. Speaker, my great grandfather was the CCF candidate against John Be Diefenbaker in 1957. But I will acknowledge that Prime Minister Diefenbaker made a very wise decision not long after that to maintain diplomatic relations with Cuba after the revolution rather than participating in the American embargo that contributed to a siege mentality in Cuba, which worsened repression. I'd like to ask my fellow Saskatchewan MP whether he thinks the Diefenbaker government made the right decision in maintaining diplomatic relations with Fidel Castro's government. Grasslands. Hey, Mr. Speaker, one of the problems with dealing with socialist governments is what they do to you, and uh, as my colleague from Saskatchewan knows only too well, we've suffered the consequences of that for 50 years, and we find ourselves almost in a, in a situation similar to Cuba because we were never able to reach our potential. Cuba, of course, never came close to being what it could be. Saskatchewan, we found ourselves 10 years ago, finally with a change in government, but with an economy that was one-third the size of our neighbour. We were equal with Alberta at one time. The choice to, to uh, follow the NDP for far too long meant that we fell far behind. And finally, the people of Saskatchewan uh, came to their senses, elected a government, and we've moved ahead ever since then. Questions and comments. Question and comment the Honourable Member for L London North Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, we heard a lot about history, and I'll touch on that in a moment. But uh, it's well known the Prime Minister, in his recent visit, raised human rights concerns. The member opposite has a great deal of concern about human rights uh, problems that exist in Cuba. Uh, we're quite fortunate that on this side of the House we take human rights seriously, and when we engage with countries, Mr. Speaker, human rights issues can be put onto the table. I also would point out, and here's where history comes in, or here's where history is very important. It was the Mulroney government, Mr. Speaker, that in 1985 took the unprecedented, uh, unprecedented step to enact the Foreign Extraterritorial Measures Act. Oh. It was made, this law made it illegal for firms operating in Canada to comply with any U.S. attempts to destabilize the Castro regime. This was a indication on the part of the Mulroney government and the Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time, Mr. Joe Clark, to Service. engage with Cuba, to engage in warm, friendly relations with Cuba. They were, progressive they were conservatives. conservatives. Progressive conservatives. Progressive conservatives, progressive, excuse yeah, me. Yeah. So I guess there's a bit Change. of a difference Change there. Now. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, love, I'd love to hear a comment on that. Honourable Member for Cypress Hills, Grasslands. Well, he wants to talk about the uh, photo kind of an affair that the, the Prime Minister had in, Trude or in Cuba when he was down there. But actually, all the Canadians heard coming out of that, they didn't hear anything about his human rights stance. That wasn't what was emphasized. If you, if you looked at the news reports, that, that wasn't what it was about. It was about him meeting and celebrating with Raul Castro and with his sons and then lamenting the fact that he didn't get to meet with Fidel. 
That was, what, that was what the general public heard about that visit. They didn't hear anything about him standing up for Cuban human rights. And I would suspect, Mr. Speaker, it's because he didn't. Reprise to the bar.